Welcome to The Indispensables. I'm Bruce Tolgan, and today I have the distinct pleasure of having Dr. Mark Ranella. Uh, that's, he's not a medical doctor. Uh, he's a PhD uh, in American history, one of my favorite subjects. And I went to college with this guy. Uh, he had a reputation uh, back then for being super smart. So you'll, you'll see what I mean um, in, in, in a minute. Um, I, and, and Mark has a lot to share, uh, but I will just tell you that, um, you know, he's not a CEO, but he coaches MBA students at Harvard Business School about how to write properly. And uh, uh, he actually works at um, uh, Harvard Business Publishing. And he is the author of a forthcoming book called The One Idea Rule, An Efficient Way to Improve Your Writing at School and Work. Uh, I read it. It's it's really good. Um, if you have to do some writing or you have someone in your life who has to do some writing, uh, get them the book and then uh, all of a sudden they'll know how to write. Um, and uh, anyway, there's a lot I'm looking forward to talking with Mark about. Uh, it's been a while since we've reconnected. And let me just say, Mark Ronella, welcome to The Indispensables. Bruce, I am so happy to be here. This uh, I remember conversations with you at Amherst. They were great. And I anticipate this one will be as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, it's 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 a privilege to have you. And um, uh, I said a little bit about uh, uh, your career path. You have a very interesting career path. Is uh, one of the reasons I want our listeners to meet you. Uh, tell us your story. Where, where, where did you come from? Uh, how did you get here? How did you find yourself working at Harvard Business Publishing and coaching MBA students at Harvard? Business school, the people who are going to go out and run the world. Uh, you no, know, you're 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 a history scholar. Uh, how did you tell us your story? Well, I think the thread that combines or that connects the beginning to the middle of the end could be teaching, right? I feel like I'm a teacher. Uh, I figured that out maybe in my mid twenties. Um, that that identity was really a great one. Now, how did I? keep that identity while my career changed, I think, you know, because I think I needed to know my my foundational self. I love teaching. I love helping people get those light bulb moments, right? But, you know, things change and sometimes you have to adjust with it. So what I did in my life is that I, I came out with the, this vocational goal. Now, we had great American history teachers in undergrad, and I was very motivated to teach Americans American history. Because it's something that Americans didn't know very well, often, and it's something that's incredibly useful. So that was my goal, and that's what I said to get a PhD. So um, yeah, and by the way, Mark, that this is God's work. I mean, uh, there are way too many Americans who don't really understand American history, and I think American civic life is suffering as a result. You know, I agree, and, and you know, from the research point of view, the PhD point of view. You know, it almost doesn't matter what your encyclopedic knowledge is, so long as you remain open to the fact that history is important, right? So that when you enter a discussion, you like, well, I want to know how we got here, you know, and, you know, a little background research would be very helpful, you know, so uh, just knowing that would be would have been my goal to inspire people to say, yeah, history is an, is part of this conversation, right? Um, so when I was so I, I eventually got my PhD, eventually went out. I think the highlight of my teaching was that I was a lecturer at the history and literature program at Harvard University. That was a great sort of testing ground for, you know, people who almost finished their dissertations or just finished them. And it was sort of like an Oxford Cambridge setting with these very small classrooms. You know, that was just amazing. Always have great memories of that. Um, but as my as I went into sort of the full time teaching profession, I was noticing that the profession of college teaching was suffering, right? It didn't get as much support as the people, you know, we learned with had as they were entering their careers. And after trying a little bit, I thought, you know, I need to shift gears. I, I need to, how, how can I be, a, stay in this industry, not industry, how can I remain a teacher, but change the industry that I'm at? And I had a bunch of great advice from a bunch of different people. But the one person whose advice stuck and took me in this direction was one of the readers of my dissertation. His name is Morton Keller at Brandeis. He's deceased now. Wonderful, wonderful professor. And um, 
he, you know, I came up and said, you know, I, where can I go with this? And he said, why don't you go to Harvard Business School? Uh, because they have a lot of great research associate positions and they need all sorts of people. And, uh, and I said, okay. So I was still at Harvard uh, uh, at the history and literature program, got in, you know, got to know the HR person at uh, HBS. And about a year and a half later, there was a marketing professor who loved cultural history. And I, you know, for branding, you know, and why brands are so uh, lasting and, and uh, impactful. And there, that was my entrance, you know, so um, I mean, it's I want- so interesting because just to draw a bright line under that. So here you get your PhD in American history at Brandeis. Right. And uh, I suppose your your dissertation advisor uh, who's giving you this advice is also a history professor. Oh, yes. And, and of course, within the empire of Harvard, because, you know, for those people who are like, well, Harvard doesn't really run the world, do they? No, they do. They do. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but but, it, but it's its own universe in and of itself, its own kind of empire. Uh, and and so his advice to you was, um, hey, uh, your skill set, your uh, wisdom, uh, you you could offer a lot. And and here's mm-hmm. an unlikely place: go over to Harvard Business School and see see if see if they're interested. And sure enough, well, it was I was amazed uh, and and very gratified. Um, and so what I did is I kept that identity as a teacher. Uh, but I'm going to teach through writing. So it be, I became more like a teacher writer in a sense, right? How can I teach through writing? So uh, worked for a year with a marketing professor. Next year, I worked with the now former dean, uh, Nathan Noria. We co-wrote a book um, called Entrepreneurs, Managers, and Leaders. Um, along yeah, with and Tom that's, t- t- and talk about that because, so for one thing, here you are, <laughs> right? Uh, you're, oh, I'm not sure what I want to do. You're over at Harvard <laughs> Business School all of a sudden. Uh, you're, 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 you're dovetailing with a marketing professor and just like that, you're, 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 uh, all of a sudden you're writing a book with the Dean and if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is about the airline industry. Right. Right. <laughs> well, it was the future Dean at that time. Uh, but, uh, I had, uh, written a dissertation on the Im- impact of travel on culture. So, uh, so I was very interested in travel. Now my travel is 19th century steamship travel. <laughs> but I, but I was still interested in travel, and um, luckily uh, the Aviator came out that year and inspired him. Said, "Wow, that's a great industry, you know." So we we worked on that for you know, about a year and a half. It required a lot of research. I did the sort of eighty percent of the history uh, text, and uh, the uh, Tony Mayo and Nathan Noria added their very very incredible business acumen. To fill out the other twenty percent to get the business, you know, sort of uh, deep meaning from the history that I was looking at, and uh, so that was that was great. And of course, as Morton Keller had prophesized, you'll learn a lot about business, you know. And so, uh, so I uh, I then uh, after that I, I wrote some cases as well. Got to know case writing. Worked with the case research group there. Then I transitioned to a. Um, uh, an executive ed corporation. That was a perfect fit. Uh, and it was a wonderful, wonderful group called the Concourse Group. Um, so we did uh, exec ed and HR and IT. And then the uh, 2008 recession hit. And uh, so that ended that. But a few years later, after I had sort of, you know, uh, Jerry rigged a, a little mini career in the, that crisis, um, an old friend of mine from HBS called me from Harvard Business Publishing, said, Mark, we have a research position that's quite sophisticated. Uh, do you think you want to help? I said, of course. <laughs> and uh, so I've been there. And what I've been doing at publishing is mainly, but not only, but mainly curation, which is one of the central sort of important functions for a publishing firm, especially if they have you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of items, you know, that's the sort of good and bad news about Harvard Business Publishing Catalog. We've got a ton of stuff, but it can present problems in finding it. So we- Yeah, have- and by the way, you know, just for the record, uh, sure. this has nothing to do with why uh, Mark is on the show here, but uh, but my most recent book, The Art of Being Indispensable at Work, is published uh, by Harvard uh, Business Publishing. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, from my perspective, just having anything to do with those folks has made me feel so grown up, Mark. <laughs> I mean, for all of my work up until now, you know, I, I just feel like, look, look, I'm, I'm legit Harvard, right? <laughs> and, and I even had an article in the Harvard Business Review. Can you believe it? You know, um, and uh, so, you know, I, I'm not a doctor, but now finally um, my father can hold his head up high. <laughs> That's right. You're doing something with your life there, Bruce. That's yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so I mean, I get the I mean, I get the idea of anchoring yourself and, and why it would be compelling. I mean, Harvard is such an a incredible institution. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's so much important work going on there. Right. And the way it gets expressed in my division, which is higher ed, which is directed towards business education, per se, um, it's very exciting. You know, we are one thing that I really like um, is that we can curate and we have on a sort of sister site to the main website, a bunch of curation um, uh, uh, tool, not tools, but uh, a repository with all sorts of subjects over hot topics, over standard topics, gives professors a lot of sort of very quick groupings of materials that they can apply either to their classroom directly or as inspiration uh, for thinking, oh, here's how somebody organized their strategy course. Maybe I'll do something similar. Um, and we know that people spend twice as much time on that little part of the site that we've been working on than the regular higher ed site. And that's because- that right? Giving, yeah. And so we're giving them more things to think about. And I think that's what professors want to do. We are sort of helping to teach or and or inspire professors, which is really great. I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. And we get feedback and, you know, they like this and that. One thing we're thinking about very much is uh, targeting more regional topics uh, around the globe, uh, although they may like, you know, the GE case or the, you know, um, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the University of Chicago case about MBA programs. They would like to know what's going on in their region. And I think we're doing more and more curation. Uh, we will be, you know, t- to that end, helping. Yeah, and, and, and look, I think curation in today's information environment, um, uh, it, it, it's hard to say enough about the importance of curation. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody carries around a handheld supercomputer. Everybody can go to what seem like legitimate sources of information. There's more information produced in a day than all of us could master in a lifetime. And, you know, okay, you could say, well, anything that's in the Harvard universe of, of content has probably been pretty well vetted. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but, but also there's, there's such a sea of, of available information. Um, one of the things that is great about experts, one of the things that's great about professors, well, mm-hmm. editors, librarians, mm-hmm. uh, is that they're bringing a different level of expertise and care to the selection of information because you cannot get your way through everything. Um, and, and, and what, you know, there's so much, uh, uh, autodidact, uh, ism going mm-hmm. on and so much self-directed learning and so much available information. It's, it's really, um, profound. But my view is, for my money, uh, I'll uh, I'd like to read something that an expert, a professor, a scholar uh, mm-hmm. says. Yeah, th- read this one. Uh, and so I think it cannot be uh, emphasized enough how important that work is. Well, it is very gratifying when we get responses like, "Oh, this is very helpful," uh, and 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 also knowing just seeing the click rate. You know, people are staying there, like I said, twice as long. And we know they're getting inspired as well. And and that kind of confidence that somebody at Harvard had looked through this and said, this is pertinent material for this subject, certainly just gives them a, a level of comfort uh, with uh, spending their time on that website. So um, that's been that's been very gratifying. Um yeah, and then let, let me just interrupt you for a second because I really want to drill down on on uh, uh, a little more of this story, and I and I'm eager to get to your to your book as as a subject of conversation because 
Um, you know, I, I read it. I consider it. Thank you, um, Bruce, by the way. It, thank you for reading thank it. Thank you for sending me an advanced copy. And I, yeah. I'm, I, I, I consider it's, it's going to be such a good gift to so many people because uh, writing is such an important way to be able to communicate, to make yourself known, to make your ideas known, to give yourself opportunities. Um, you know, especially in the working world, uh, obviously, uh, when you're in school. Uh, but I think this is a book that um, is going to make an impact. And, and I, for one, intend to give it as a gift to a lot of people. Thank but you. Before, the one idea rule is what it's called. It's coming out in August 2023. Um, uh, for those who are, you know, in, in the future, looking back on this episode as an oldie. Um, <laughs> but uh, um uh, but before we get to that, I, I just I'm, I'm interested in your career path, because what I think is so um, compelling is you know, here you are, uh, you, you have, you know, your brain is bigger than most. Um, you know, you 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 were very successful in school. You hear you went and got a Ph.D. Uh, you're, 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 you're you're teaching. Uh, you, you end up, you know, at, at Harvard. Great place to land. But even with that kind of pedigree. You were not immune from the vicissitudes of a recession. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and you said that, OK, so here it's, it's no small thing that uh, the same institution, uh, other decision makers within Harvard said, oh, go, go, go talk to this guy. You know, he'd be great. Uh, let's get him back here. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 even somebody with your credentials, even an institution like Harvard, um, uh, uh, you know, you. It's not always a clear path. You never declare victory. And so you had enough uh, background from Harvard that you you had joined a consulting firm. You're out there giving advice. And then, mm. boom, the, <laughs> the, 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 the economy. Now, that was a pretty bad recession. I've it was a bad through, one. I've lived through several one. of them right now. The only reason uh, uh, we were so busy during then is because we were working with the military primarily, and they mm. they're always busy. Right, um, right. But uh, but but uh, so, so so but you said you you sort of uh, jury rigged a uh, uh, um, uh, a chapter there. I'm curious yeah. about what that was that you did because I think most mere mortals, you know, they hear these interviews and they think, well, you know, okay, I can learn from this guy, but I'm never going to be this guy. But when people hear that, oh, you had a, a, a you had to scramble too. I think that's mm -hmm. meaningful for people, right? I, I I think it's true. I mean, you know, in the social media age, we're always preening our best selves, you know. And there's plenty of stuff. We're all human, you know. And there's no 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 guaranteed path. So when I got the notice that I'd have like three months severance, you know. Uh, and uh, I think this was, yeah, summer of 2008. I think that was when that happened. Um, that severance gave me a little leeway, thank goodness. And um, what I did realize, so I live in Arlington, Massachusetts. And what I realized after a while, after panicking for about two weeks, <laughs> was that I, um, I live amongst a bunch of professionals, right? There, I, you know, you throw a stick, you're going to get like a doctor and an architect and, you know, an administrator, all this stuff. Sure. So I, sure, thought, sure. So I thought like, how am I going to network with them? So I've got two little kids. When you say, oh my God, how can you do this? And I was like, oh no, I've got two little kids. They've got friends at school <laughs> wow. who has parents, right? So what I did was, and this is, a, I should write a little book about this or a short story. And, um, and, and not to draw too fine a point, but sure. you know, here you have little kids. One of the reasons you're probably panicking is you got two little kids. Yeah, completely, yeah. completely. And you just sort of have to like keep your composure, not freak out in front of them, but I'm freaking out, right? But then I thought, okay, all their parents, are professionals. All their, their, all their friends' parents are professionals. How can I use that? And I thought, why don't I have a party, right? And the thing is, you know, it's true, and this is a bit of preening in a way, <laughs> it's hard to draw people to you when you're sad, you know, when you're like, oh, I've been abused or all oh, I've been neglected or all oh, my job was very bad to me. You know, people don't, aren't drawn to that, right? Yep. So um, what I did immediately after I got laid off is I did send out an email to everybody I knew saying, Hey, I lost my job. If you know of anything, let me know, you know, and here's my resume. So I did that. That was the only panicked to the outside world. Then after that, I invited them to parties 
and they were called Fun Fridays. So I had them at my house and I made sure they were theme parties that the kids and the adults could enjoy together. And of course, because I was unemployed, I had a lot of time <laughs> to plan wow. these things, you know? So like, for instance, and I'd ask my kids, what do you want to do? We do, uh, the first one was Latin night. And when we did space night, and then Ben came in with bug night, you know, so we, you know, and, and people love that because I don't know, you had things like, you know, gummy worms, you know, for as hors d'oeuvres and people were like, oh, I love that gummy worms. It's so funny. You know, they right, right. that. you know, I had frozen grasshoppers to drink because it was really hot and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But people love that. And so and they had in the back of their head, he needs a job. But I didn't front load that. I was like, we're having a party, have some pizza and a drink. You know, so the adults were in the kitchen. The kids were in the living room watching movies and playing games. We had food in the middle where people would gather and I got both of my jobs from that. Essentially, I got a job from a neighbor who's a very, very smart guy in innovation, has a small innovation uh, sort of consulting firm. And he said, look, you know, I don't have a ton of money right now, but I do have this money and I do have this job. Would you like it? I said, yes. <laughs> so, wow. so, so I got that and I was there for a year. And then somebody whom I had invited on the original email, whom I knew through Harvard said, Mark, we've got a, we've got a job here at publishing. Can you come? And I said, yes. And that's how that went. But it all came from fun Fridays. Uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah. And another way to think about that is because, you know, not everybody has uh, the wherewithal to throw uh, a party every Friday, right. uh, especially when they're feeling like, uh, gee, what am I going to do? Right. Uh, what I love about what you're saying is um, uh, it, it's the exact opposite of there's nothing I can do. Right. It's what can we do here? And um, and and at the very least, right, because networking for the sake of networking is awkward. But if right. what you're saying is, hey, look, you know, I'm going to let you know I've got the skills and background uh, to do a lot of things. Uh, but um, I'm going to let you know that. But what we're really going to do is get together every Friday. And, you know, then people know, oh, you know, is this somebody uh, I like the cut of his jib? And uh, right, very well put. Right. Right. And, and, and uh, all right, then, then let's do something. So, so, so then you, uh, that's how you got yourself back into, into the uh, workforce, back in, 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 into the empire. Yes. Uh, eventually back to Harvard. And, yes. um, and, and, but, but, but it sounds, and I don't know if I'm, I'm just for sake of uh, 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 poetic uh, continuity, I'm going to hope that what you were doing for your friend who runs the innovation company is uh -huh. some kind of writing and teaching. Um, if not, just keep your poker face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because no. writing and writing and teaching seems to be the theme here. Oh, um, absolutely! No, no, and, and I was doing, I was doing that there. Yeah, I yeah, was, and 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 um, uh, and it's it's. Um, Writing and teaching is so much of a through line for human evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, here it is the through line for your working life and career. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and, and so you pick back up there. You're, you know, here you are. You're obviously you're the kind of guy who gets the attention of professors all of a sudden want to write a book with you. Right. Um, you're, uh, you, you, people are turning to you and saying, hey, you know, these finance guys getting their MBAs, they need help writing. Right. Uh, can, can, you know, can can you help? <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, you know, when when one of these uh, men or women or uh, um, uh, or non-binary um, uh, MBAs um, end up uh, running the world, as surely they will. Right. Uh, they're going to remember you taught them how to write. I hope that's the case. I hope that's the case. Yeah, I. I, uh, you know, I, I, I network with people. I'm a very, you know, extroverted person, as you know, and I like connecting. And luckily, uh, the, way, the way I got to coaching MBA students was an old friend in my network. There is a, uh, in student academic services, uh, there is writing coaching. You know, there's also, you know, math tutors and things like that. But um, MBAs at Harvard have to take case exams that are timed so they don't take them home. Um, and you know, there's a lot that they can question themselves about as they're taking an exam, you know, do I understand this? Did I calculate this correctly? You know, is this the right framework? Um, but also, you know, 
can I write well? Is this, you know, am I, am I being clear? You know, all that kind of stuff. So in a way we help to, to pull apart all the components and help them focus on one at a time. That's what I, at least I do. And, um, and so I was asked to uh, do that in 2018 started. And so this is our segue back to my book, uh, yes. which I'll let you know about. So one thing I had done uh, when I was teaching was that I asked myself, what is, because, you know, I'm teaching literature, I'm teaching history, which means, of course, I have to teach writing, right? Because that's a part of it. So I, so I asked myself, what is the one piece of advice I could give that had have, would have the most impact? You know, because what could they remember and work on, right? And it turned out to be this one idea rule, you know, which not to, you know, uh, not to keep it secret here for too long, which is, you know, <laughs> every component of a well-written document should express only one idea, which is that's the rule. Um, and it's powerful, by the way, like, you know, okay. if you if you if if you're uh, uh, listening to this episode and, you know, you, you drop your phone and you're all done, you know, remember this part. Right. Because because it's a, one of the things I love about the book is it's a very straightforward lesson you're teaching. Yes. Um, you know, in the world of, you know, teaching and writing advice there's often like just too much of it or, or there's too many, too much minutia. Right. So it puts people sort of on their heels. I can't remember all that, you know, and there's 57 ways to, you know, end your paper. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, you know, but can I remember them all? Of course not. You know, so I'm trying to think what approach has wide applicability as they're writing. And the reason I came up with it though, was because I realized that all these, a lot of smart people who wrote poorly, it was not for lack of enthusiasm. I may have been too, too much enthusiasm. It was for, wasn't for lack of insight. It's for lack of focus, right? And so, you know, they'd want to talk about everything because they're smart and they can make connections. And they're like, ah, oh, you know, and in a conversation, that is great. Sort of like in this, you know, in this podcast, we can go here and there because you can ask me questions. I can follow up. I can ask you questions, you know. That's when you're writing, you don't have that luxury, you know, which is yeah, why writing is writing is painfully linear, ultimately. And, uh, uh, you know, having written books, I can tell you one, what, one of the things that, you know, always gets in my way as I'm sorting things out mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, even sequencing of, you know, I, I, I always want to stop and tell you everything about this thing, right. Rather than being patient and, uh, and, and letting, you know, having confidence that I can tell you this other thing later. It, that, you know, that last thing you just said is so important because I would tell people like, Hey, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Those are three papers, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and do one at a time. It's great. You know, right. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just that here together, it's confusing, right? You know, it's not focused. So that in itself helps to eliminate a million problems, right? I'd go and, like I said in my book, you know, I'd come up with my felt marker and do this and that, but then they come back with the same problems. Why was that? It's because they still didn't focus. It wasn't because they weren't trying. I mean, some people didn't try. But often it was just lack of discipline, you know, or and, and, and maybe a lack of connection with their, you know, imaginary reader. You know, it's like, why didn't you get that? You know, or why? You know, that was interesting, wasn't it? Why am I getting a B minus? You know, um, and, you know, I might say, well, you're not really answering the question, you know, for instance, you know, right. and, and, you know, and and stuff like that. So this piece of advice seemed to work. So it lay dormant for a while because I wasn't teaching. Then I got this wonderful opportunity that I'm still immensely grateful for uh, to have these half hour, hourly sessions with HBS students who need help with their writing. And now this is not the magic pill for every writing problem, but it often was very um, reassuring for these very, very smart people. Often either say that English wasn't their first language, or they were very quant oriented and they, they, they consciously avoided writing because they were great at quant and right, bored with writing. Uh, but it was very reassuring that this, if they really understood this, that this would translate into a clearer 
piece, you know, into a clear statement. And as I kept on using it, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, if this works with Harvard MBA students, I mean, imagine who else it could help, you know? And so- And the answer to that is anyone who needs to communicate in writing and those who don't realize they need to communicate in writing, they just don't realize. Right, right. <laughs> because in, in fact, we live in an escritorial age. You know, people are IMing each other, they're True. texting each other. Uh, they're on uh, social media making comments. Of course, everyone can 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 create a a video of themselves now. Right. Uh, but but there's so much that we uh, uh, I guess email is passe these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's you know and 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 you know of course students uh, can learn a huge amount from this book. But I operate with uh, uh, business leaders and executives all the time mm -hmm. who. Uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're not clear in how they communicate mm -hmm. in writing. And I suspect if you master this uh, in writing, you're also going to get better at verbal communication. As well. Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 it's the same principle. And I have my own like theory slash diagnosis about one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that you might find a lot of business leaders being less effective in writing than they might be. And I think that business, and I understand why, I've been there for a while or around it, business rewards generally very quick thinking, right? Um, because lots of problems pop up, all of a sudden, you've got two weeks to figure it out, and you've got to draw on all this experience plus all these different disciplines. And, you know, in my, in my mind, I go, God bless them because I can't do that, <laughs> <It's> right? <laughs> I'm okay. not... I'm not, I'm not a sort of system. I can't, I can't get multiple things quickly. That's not the way I work. The way I work is by accretion. But that said, when you write, it's the opposite skill in a way, right? You are, if, in the best case scenario, you are focused on something over and over and over again. And instead of like drawing on a million things, you know, and bringing them together quickly, you are really focusing on one thing and digging and digging and digging deeper and deeper and deeper to a richer understanding. Let's put it that way. I mean, in the best uh, like in, like you build build a foundation, then break it down, spell it out, break it down, spell it out, and you're building a story that is uh, uh, going deeper and deeper. I I like that. I think that's true. Right. Yeah. And you know, there there you know every every communication have its has its place. You know, if you want to talk about a lot of stuff, well, keep it light, right? A little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of that. And it's perfectly fine if it's for the right place and the right audience. But if you want deep understanding, thorough understanding, or to sort of confront a complex problem, you got to focus, you know? And, and I think that could be, you know, a, a weakness within business because, you know, the day-to-day the -day or week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month crises or problems, they need tending to, but they often soak up, I don't know, the majority of, or if not all, of executives' time, you know. Yeah, and, 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 and look, so much of what people have to communicate about with each other in the workplace is, I need something from you, you need something from me. Uh, or, or to your point, something uh, comes up that needs to be solved, and so... I need something from each of you, and then we're all going to work interdependently, and so we're going to all need things from each other. Right. And uh, my observation is that one of the biggest things that goes wrong is that we don't fully understand what each other does, what um. each other brings to the table, and what each of us needs from each other. Mm. And why is that? Because we're not making it clear to each other, here's what I do, here's how I do it, here's how I can help you. Here's what I need from you. Mm. Help me understand how how you do that <laughs> and what's going to be involved. Right? There's there's uh, it's so basic uh, and it is uh, hiding in plain sight. Right. And I think your book, if, if the skill set you teach and the the technique, it's 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 one technique with many 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 uh, uh, um, permutations and, right, and right. details, but it's it's. I guess it's a principle with many techniques. Um, one principle, many techniques. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it, it really 
is a tangible thing that people will start practicing and telling other people about. I really do. Oh, you know, Bruce, I, I so much appreciate that that estimation. I think I agree with you. I, I feel that way too. I wanted people, I wanted a 16 year old, a 26 year old, or maybe a 66 year old, you know, um, to think, I understand that rule. I remember it. Oh yeah. That's what that, how that is applied to a paragraph. I can see that this paragraph's a little too long for somebody to understand that it's just one idea. Maybe I need to make an adjustment, you know, or I've got this mangled sentence. Oh, there's two ideas in it. Okay. I'll just have one idea per sentence. Great. You know, so that's what I'm hoping is that that rule sticks to their mind. And then as a new situation pops up, they'll remember, oh yeah, that's how you apply it here. You know, that's yeah, and 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 by the way, it's a great uh, example. It's a great object lesson in the the more things get complicated, the more things change, uh, the more people should remember the fundamentals and practice mm-hmm. the fundamentals. Well, you know, I think there's a yin and yang to that, Bruce. Um, with this simple or at least strong foundation, right? It if you keep your eye on the prize, your eyes on that one idea, the goal, the title, the theme of your paper, book, report, whatever, you have the opportunity of creating something wonderfully complex or understanding things that are complex. You know, it gives you that foundation so that you can venture out into an intellectual area that's really difficult, you know, or, and it also send you signals when you've reached your limit. <laughs> in a way, right? If you're really doing one idea at a time and you're being and you're being honest with yourself, you're like, wow, I can't articulate this next point. I need to do some research or whatever, right? So Yeah, and that's where you 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 talk about how discovery is is such an important part of writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's where you go back to do more research. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also uh, uh, talk about how uh, the the process of writing and discovery can be evolutionary. Where you start may not be where you end up as you're writing. Absolutely. You know, I think people are scared of that sometimes when they're writing, especially if they've been browbeaten in you know school, like, you know, you can't write well, you're not clear, whatever. You know, they'll keep that identity. And every time they run into a bit of a thicket, you know, in, on, their, on their journey to writing a paper, they, they shy away from it. You know, what I want people to know is that when you focus, you're going to learn stuff or articulate stuff you hadn't done before, or like a half-baked idea you had in your head, you finally have to like represent it by a sentence or two. And you're like, oh, I really meant this, you know? And then you're like, okay, well, my paper should be, I should adjust my paper a little bit because I just revealed something to myself about this subject that requires a little change, you know, and that's great. I mean, what I want people to do is be drawn to that discovery. And like, you know, when, if you are really focused while you're writing, you're on a magical mystery tour, you know, it's like, you know, instead, instead of people going, Oh God, I hate writing. I don't like correcting da, 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 da. I want to say, look, if you can be disciplined, if you keep that one idea in mind, being disoriented won't be as scary as it was. You know, yeah, and it, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? That the that the the one idea rule, uh, the focusing like a laser beam, uh, could take you on such a circuitous route of discovery <laughs> and exploration. Absolutely, um, you know, it's like let's say it's a flashlight, right, uh, in a dark place, and uh, at least it gives you it, you know what's ahead. Uh, and if you, for instance, see some shadow hit that flashlight, you might want to turn left because something's interesting. But you did not anticipate it without having had that light flash in one direction in the first place. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think that when people are, are writing, you know, even experienced writers, but especially people who are not experienced writers, um, you either get stuck because you don't know where to start or you, 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 there, there's so much you want to say and it's mm. hard to unpack. Um, or uh, you start writing and it gets away from you. It, it mm. starts going here or there. What I like about your your book and, and the things you're saying um, is that it makes both of those things okay. 
and gives you uh, an anchor that helps both when you're stuck and paralyzed and when you feel like your writing is spinning out of control, right? It, it, it does the work in both places, which is, a, which is a good sign that it might really be one of those fundamentals. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping you're right. You know, one of the discoveries I made while I was writing, and there were a ton of them, um, was to sort of articulate to myself the wonderful tension between your first title, you know, or theme, and what you're writing. There, there's always, there can always be a disconnect because, you know, you haven't really tested your ideas. You are testing your ideas in writing. And then when there is that tension, let's call it, it's not, it's not only uncomfortable, but it's also potentially productive. You know, it's like rubbing two sticks together. That tension might get a spark and then boom, you got something. But it's a natural tension and people are like, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. You know, we always change. There's a great book I love called The 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 um, the Art of Revision instead of writing. Right. OK. And it, so it just says, look, just be just uh, relax. You know, you are going to revise. You can't finish something, you know, in one try. You, got you know, there, there, there's a good friend of ours, Pamela Haig, uh, who uh, uh, went to graduate school here with Debbie at Yale. And uh, she has a new book out with uh, Yale Press called, well, it's about a year old now. She actually was a guest on the podcast earlier. Oh. Um, but uh, Pamela Haig, her, her book is called Revise. Mm. And, um, and that's really aimed at... Um, scholarly writers who are having a hard time turning their dissertation into a book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think your book speaks more to pretty much everyone who needs to write anything, whether you're writing a letter uh, or um, you're preparing a PowerPoint presentation for mm -hmm. a group of executives, right. um, uh, whatever it, you know, it, it, it gives you, um, I think it, 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 it gives you courage. It's, it's a, um, it's, it's very structuring, you know, like, so if you were to like, like, what would you do if you were to give the punch list, right? I'm saying to you, Hey, Mark, I got to get this thing. I've got a meeting at nine o'clock tonight. Cause it's people in Australia <laughs> and, and, and I got to make, you know, I got to, I got to just get this thing across. Like your advice, I think you can give me a punch list. Well, here's what you do. Right. Right. Um, and, and, uh, just for the sake of our, our, listeners uh to whet well, their appetite how, how do you get somebody started in that case well i was in that situation in a way i was helping a friend of mine with a nonprofit who wanted to get a letter out immediately and so i was sort of under the gun so here's the approach i would do so she says you know dear such and such i said no 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 we're not going to start composing right now we're going to just start getting out all the points we think are important so let's just say it in bullet point fashion, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's like eight different points. And from there, I could make groupings of those points, right? So maybe four, two, two or something like that. And, uh, and then think, okay, is there an order to these points, you know? Um, and if there is, is there a story, a line, a theme then that I can tell from that order? Right. I don't start composing until until I've gotten that. Let's say I'm under the gun. Right. Um, I don't start composing until I see some. And you saw that in the book, a narrative arc. Yeah. And, 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 and but it even sounds like before you have. So you're going to build your narrative arc. But I think you're saying, well, you first went, why am I doing this? What's your yes. purpose? Right. What's your purpose? And then uh, which, which I think is great. And uh, really, why are you writing this? And then, okay, what are the key things you need to get across? Right. And then, uh, you, and then you're saying, then group them, and then mm -hmm. look at a sequence, and then you have a story arc. There you go. There you go. And you've also you also eliminate number nine and ten that don't really belong in that arc. Right. That's, that's a different. That's a different paper. That's a different paper. Exactly. That's on your mind, but it's not for this. <laughs> exactly. And and when you can do that, you avoid a million problems. It's when you want to like, you know, tape on some limb to something that doesn't belong. That's when you get your Frankenstein monster. Right. But then, you know, just take it away. 
and do it another time. So, so, so if I were to bottle this, it's, you know, stop and ask yourself, why are you writing this? Mm-mm. Then uh, in no particular order, write down your the key points you want to get across. Yes. It doesn't have to be in beautiful prose. Just put them down there. Right. Then group them together. Put them in the right order. You've got a story arc, right? Now exactly. you can compose. Exactly. Now, exactly. and that would be true of a PowerPoint presentation to the board. It would be true of a PowerPoint presentation to your boss. It would be true of a letter. It would be true of of an article. It would be true of, of, of a book. And and uh, that's why, you know, so many people are so intimidated about writing. What I love about this is it's such sophisticated uh theory, such sophisticated background you have, uh, that this is coming from the most sophisticated place it could come from really. Um, and it's, and you're spoon feeding this to somebody in a way it's simple. It's not easy. It's simple, right? But, but simple doesn't mean easy. Simple doesn't mean that it can't address the complex. It's, it's a simple solution to a very complex dilemma. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, 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 I note in my acknowledgments, my 11th grade English teacher, who is the sort of inspirational voice, I really am imitating her when I'm writing this book. Um, and she had this combination of, you knew she was serious. You knew she wasn't going to let you, you know, go through easily, not easily. It wasn't, she was a taskmaster, but she was giving you really hard, interesting issues to deal with. And um, and it's because she respected us. She thought these 16, 17 year olds, they can think. I know they can think. And we and I swear that was so inspiring. I know you've had teachers like that. Too, yeah, right? I, that, that draw I have. Out. But, you know, what's fantastic is, um, you know, is the teacher you remember uh, the one who said, figure it out on your own? Is the teacher you remember the one who said, you know, don't worry about it. It's, you know. No, the teacher you remember is the one who holds you to a high standard, but then makes it achievable. Yes, absolutely. And that's the motivation, right? Like I am not left adrift. So I can call her and say, should I make a left turn or a right turn? Or she might answer, well, here's your criteria to know if you make left or right, but you're going to get some help. Right. And and she was always there. So I I hope this book is in a way always there. For people, you know, it has those little summaries at the end of each chapter. So after you've read it, hopefully you can just refresh your memory and say, oh, yeah, that's what he said about sentences. I'll, I'll do that. You know? Yeah, it, do, it does the job. It's fantastic. The one idea rule, an efficient way to improve your writing at school and work. Mark Ranella of Harvard Business Publishing. <laughs> uh, but this book is his. Who, who's the publisher? It's called Ben Bella Books. And they're uh, they're a great you know sort of nonfiction uh, uh, publishing firm. Uh, I would like to say personally, uh, Katie Dickman, my my editor, is a dream. I've never worked with anybody as helpful as she, and I'm really help very very thankful for working with this publishing firm. So even even an expert on writing needs an editor. There you go, um, uh, uh, Mark Ranella. Thank you for being a guest on the Indispensables. It's great to be here, Bruce. Thank you for having me. It was great. Fantastic. Thanks so much.